Uh, my name is Pierre Pennings, and I'll be talking about how we can make Nixos easier for self-hosting by using module contracts. So first, a little bit about me. Uh, my handle is Ebizaman. Thank you, Will, by the way, for giving me a reason that I, so that I don't need to explain what, where it comes from. Uh, so I'm, um, I, figure I find myself as a self-hosting and data sovereignty advocate. Um, at Fastly, I work as a staff engineer on the next generation web application firewall product. Uh, by the way, there's a cool fast forward program for open source at Fastly. And fun fact, actually, I learned while I worked there, we're the CDN for the Next Packages binary, ca binary cache. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, thank you. So before starting, um, we need to go a little bit um, and follow my adventures. Um, using Linux. So it all started in 2008 when I switched from Windows to Ubuntu. You know, Windows was the desktop computer at home, and I saw this on the internet. Like, Compiz, I saw cool stuff, things you could do on the desktop, and I absolutely wanted that. So I, I forced everyone to switch to Ubuntu. Um, but then I kind of really liked Aptitude. I don't know if, if you know that program, but it's essentially a catalog of all the packages you can install. And I literally spent hours browsing through all the descriptions, reading everything, trying things out. And for me, that was really fun, you know? So my big takeaways for this part of my journey was I like when things look good. <laughs> and also, a catalog is really something I, I like and I want to find out. But then at some point, I went deeper. I wanted to learn more about Linux. And the thing is, sometimes I had issues understanding exactly what, well, the issue was when I encountered the problem in Ubuntu. Like, the documentation is really good, but it still has this layer of magic on top where sometimes it's just, it hides too much. So I switched to Linux mainly because I was reading the wiki and the documentation is pretty good and I could do everything uh, essentially without needing to talk to another human, which is good sometimes. Uh, but my big takeaway for that is, yes, it allows onboarding and self-service if you have good documentation. Then some while later, you know, I had this Linux box at home and I installed a lot of things on that thing. Like I, I was trying everything I could, but it was just too much. Like I was doing imperative, you know, going SSHing in and trying to, um, to, to, to tweak everything. And when I upgraded the box, I forgot what I did and it was just a mess. So at some point I figured out, hey, um, there's this Emacs thing I'm using uh, to edit things. And everybody knows Emacs is not just an editor, it's also a full operating system. So I was like, hey, shouldn't we use an operating system to configure an operating system? And I was like, sure, let's do that. So I used all the features I could find uh, of Emacs to, um, well, look at this. Um, it's essentially an interactive checklist of things I needed to do to install a service on my box. So you see at the top there's variables, some comes from a secret store, and then you have multiple steps uh, of things I needed to do. So uh, just example, you don't, I, okay, perfect, you can read it. Um, so yes, there's an install step here, there's a step to create a Postgres user, there's a step to uh, generate a file that gets copied over to the to the server um, to configure the reverse proxy. And then I wanted to add key cloak in there to have a single sign-on at home. I mean, I'm crazy, I guess. But that was pretty cool. And I tried to do that, but I needed to shell out to bash scripts because it just became too complicated. And this thing, I mean, I, I know what you're thinking, but it worked. It was, I was very proud of how it worked. Um, but I came to this, like, this is like the top level, you know, everything I installed, and it just piled on, piled on. And at some point, I was just copy pasting everything all over the place, and it became, again, unmanageable. Um, I was doing software work, you know, on the side. I mean, I guess, to pay the bills, so it's not really on the side. This is on the side. Um, but I was using there a real programming language, and you have functions in there, and that's essentially what I was missing. But the other thing I kind of figured later, you know, going through all this and then <laughs> essentially uh, preparing this talk is that what I was missing also is this one source of truth we have in Nix. Because on my machine I was doing stuff and then I had this file and then stayed drift apart. Like literally two, two days after I started all this, things drifted apart and it was very hard to maintain. And so I kind of knew about this Nix stuff, so I wanted to try it out. 
So, um, yeah, I have these beautiful lines. I mean, remember, I like things that look good. Uh, and this services.nextcloud.enable equal true installs Nextcloud on my machine. Like, remember, like, the things I had before that I needed to do, and now I can do just this. Um, this enables Nginx for you. It sets up PHP, PHP, FPM. Um, it sets up Postgres, or and it even can let you choose between multiple databases that you want to set up. And it also allows you to choose between the different caches you want. So I was just hooked up, you know, like I, I since the moment I saw that, I, I thought, okay, I need to use Nix for everything now. And also, if you remember all my takeaways, like it checks all the boxes, like it has good looks, obviously. It has a catalog, and by the way, I learned yesterday about the Nix search thing, so I will definitely use that. Uh, it has, honestly, I think it has good documentations. It's, I, we all joke about it, and I think it's not perfect also, but I, most of the one, things I wanted to do could be done without talking to another human, which again, I, it's a good thing, I guess, for onboarding and self-service again. And it's obviously a programming language, and it handles the one source of truth pretty strictly, uh, I think we can say, but I guess it's for the best. But then that's when the honeymoon stopped a bit. Um, if you remember, I mean, I don't know if you remember from the slides I, I just went through, but I was using HAProxy as the reverse proxy for uh, and Nextcloud on my box at the time. And I wanted to switch over, you know, like gradually to NextOS. But then I hit a wall where inside the Nextcloud module, everything is hard-coded for Nginx. And you cannot really choose um, another reverse proxy. And actually, if you go in the wiki, it tells you, yeah, you can definitely use something else, but just do make force disable Nginx, and then you're on your own. <laughs> so coming to, and coming to Next, that was not a, a good experience, you know? And so yes, over reverse proxy, I was using HA proxy, but what about caddy, traffic, et cetera? And another thing, a random thing I noticed that we hard code pretty much everywhere is path to SSL certificates. I don't exactly know the reason why, but you know, we always kind of hard code slash var slash lib slash, I forgot now exactly where those lives. But coming from the software world, I feel like this should just be a variable, you know? Um, and then, I guess the thing that really bothers me the most is that, like I was saying before, you can choose in the Nextcloud module yeah, which database you want to pick, which cache you want to, to use, but that work is all done inside that Nextcloud module, and there's no way to reuse that. And I thought to myself, well, that's kind of a wasted work, you know, in a way. Like, it would be cool to extract that. Um, and so this is how I picture the situation in my brain. You have, and by the way, I'm. Uh, talking about the Nextcloud module just because that's the one I know the most. I know it does a lot of things. I'm definitely not picking on it. To the contrary, I would want the work that's being done in there to be helpful for other people. And so, again, this is how I picture the situation. There's a, this core module in the, in the middle of the Nextcloud uh, module service. Uh, and then it, you have auxiliary stuff, right? You have, um, but the thing is, to, the thing to realize is to me this is, you have a lot of implicit contracts in there. If I just take one example, say you set up MySQL, or, or I mean you, you select to set up MySQL, um, well, the thing is how the Nextcloud maintainers set up MySQL is how they want the core to be able to use MySQL. You know, there's like, uh, they set this up in a very specific way so that the core can use it in the way that the core expects. And that's completely implicit. Maybe there's a comment somewhere in the file, but that's essentially, that was in the brain of the maintainers, how they set it up to pass the test and everything. But it's in a way all gone as soon as it's pushed on GitHub and you don't have that context anymore. So the, what I would love the community actually in general to go towards to is to get all these contracts out of there um, in something like the documentation or maybe something better than that. But as a first step, um, I feel like we, sh we should have this Nextcloud module be mostly the core thing. And then it would branch out to um, those what I called contracts, which would be say, let's take the example for the reverse proxy. Um, you, you, this would, allow, this would um, show a few options that you can pick and choose um, for the core to, to use. And then on the other side, you would have the Nginx implementers um, knowing, hey, when people set these options in the contract, I know that my reverse proxy must work this way. And so think of it as a splitting the concerns here. And the, 
natural extension of that is that, well, other people can then add more implementations for these contracts completely independently of what the maintainers of Nextcloud are doing. And you could even do that on your own machine. Um, I mean, I should not encourage that, but I meant not upstreaming that to Next packages. But you know, if you have things in your, um, in your company that cannot be upstreamed, well, you can still do that and plug and play inside that Nextcloud module, for example. And how I picture this separation of concerns is now you have multiple people in the loop. You have the maintainers of Nextcloud that uses this contract, this abstraction on top of modules that exist. You have all the different maintainers of all these implementations that um, made work to respect this contract. And then you have, for self-hosting, very important, but I feel like for pretty much everything we do, there's this end user that now have the choice to pick whatever implementation they want to implement this reverse proxy thing that Nextcloud is depending on. And that's, to me, very powerful. And something we don't really have now, or at least it's hard-coded, like I was saying, in various packages here and there. And then for this reverse proxy, at some point, there needs to be talks, right, on exactly how this interface must behave uh, and everything. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. The good thing, the good news, is that this contracts already exist kind of in Next packages. If you take like the dot enable option, it's pretty much everywhere. Like when you have a service, everybody knows that everybody expects these options to exist already, but also everybody knows how this option should behave without even reading the documentation. You know that if you have a service that has dot enable, you set it to true, then this service will start uh, next time you do the next X activation. If you set it to false, then it won't or it probably won't even be pushed on the box. And then on the other side, everyone that implements a service knows that this option is expected and that if it's set to true, they should do whatever is needed to start the service. And if it's false, um, they don't need to do anything ex essentially. But that's, to me, a contract. It's nearly an explicit contract, but it's more a convention, I guess, than something that's explicitly stated that a service should have a dot .enable option somewhere in the documentation. And that's where I would like to introduce my project. Um, it's called Self Host Blocks. Uh, it's a name. And the whole reason of this project is to be a proving ground for contracts. Um, it kind of didn't start that way, but it became that. <laughs> um, but the one thing I found cool is NixOS VM test, and I used that to enforce those contracts. Um, and it implements a bunch of things. Uh, a lot of things are working progress, to be honest. Um, but I actually use that on my own server. So I think there's another person that uses that. So we're two. Um, <laughs> and um, to finish up, I'd like to show you an example of what a contract looks like and how it's used in, inside that project and why I think that's um, super valuable. So let's take the SSL certificate generator contract. Uh, this is the contract. You have seven options. Um, they have types, documentation, and everything, but we'll, I'll go through that with examples. So to see exactly the point I want to make, we need to take two examples. First, what happens when you, we generate a self-signed certificate, and we want to use that. And then second, just after that, I'll show you how that works with Let's Encrypt. Okay. So first, the self-signed one. You have this block here, these options you need to set up. Um, you need a certificate of authority. I won't go into detail how you get that, but let's say you get it. And then you set the domain and extra domain options um, to generate the certificate for these domains. Now let's switch on the generating for Let's Encrypt. Kind of similar. Um, you set specific options for Let's Encrypt. And then you have, again, the domain and extra domains you want. But now, let's see how it's used. Okay? And, um, Spoiler, that's, be, that's what I've been building up um, since the beginning of the talk. So this is where it happens. Um, and remember how there were those multiple people um, all interacting together. So there was that end user you know, selecting which implementation. Well, this is represented here in that Latin block. The user here chose the self-signed certificate. Okay? And it's inside that cert variable. And what's going to appear inside that in block is what the next cloud, say, maintainers will be using, and they will receive that as an option uh, for the module system. So here, 
um, is just setting up Nginx VirtualBox, and you see it uses the path.cert and path.key option that they know exist because of the contract, and they would set it up as a certi SSL certificate. They would set the group um, that the keys should have, you know, when they created the Schmod group, um, so that they know that Nginx will be able to read those keys. They would um, add which services need to be reloaded whenever the certificates get regenerated, here, say, every three months or something. And then, oh, yeah, right. So uh, the question was, this, is this work already happening inside Next Packages, or is it essentially um, conventions that emerged? And would it be solidifying what already exists or kind of new work? So I, I don't know, actually, to be honest, if something like that already exists. Uh, the community is so vast, and things happen in so many spaces. Um, I didn't find anything that does this, um, but these are the ones I found. And I think those emerged by convention and people just, you know, copy, copy pasting or copying on what works in other modules. And it kind of is now a convention. But yes, the, the, the goal of this would be to, to have more thoughts about other domains of, uh, again, I was thinking for my server, you know, self-hosting, but uh, maybe other aspects I'm not thinking of, like maybe some more codification of these domains and how we can make them reused um, in the space. And you had a question too? Yes? So the, the question was, or I guess a, more a statement. <laughs> Yes, you're sure that the, um, the Kubernetes folks did a lot of work that resembles that. For example, they, you have an interface that multiple reverse proxy implements. And to be honest, I'm not that familiar with Kubernetes, but that really sounds like the same thing indeed. So yes, we could probably learn a trick or two from there. Yes? Uh, so the question was kind of what happens when you scale this out uh, for the SSL generate certificate example? Um, well, to be honest, um, this is a really small scale for now. It's uh, on my own box, and then like I said, on one other people's box uh, elsewhere on the internet. So I didn't hit that yet, um, nor any kind of using Nix at scale. So I'm sorry, I wouldn't be able to really answer on how to do it the best way. Yes, that's a actually good question. I'm not, I did it in a way in that project, but I'm not sure I really like it. The way I did that has, a, it's to have a common library of options. And for example, you have for this generate certificate, cert, blah, 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 this contract, <laughs> you have a, essentially a, an attribute set inside that library with all the options. And when you say, for example, the Nextcloud uh, module says, hey, I want you to give me something that implements that contract. It just use it, reuses that whole block of options and put it there as an option inside that module. It works. Uh, I'm not sure if it's the best way to do that, though. All right, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>